Thanks for having me here. Um, this is a, a talk where we're going to look at using some aspects of the machine to improve um, the communication costs of a very, uh, very specific um, algorithm. And I'll get to that after a kind of a series of, of uh, motivating remarks. This is a, um, uh, an ACT2 facility that we have at Illinois on, on plasma formation. Um, I'll show you some more specifics of that in two slides. Um, I use blue waters to solve large sparse linear systems. Um, and to study the performance, AX equals B, so matrix A, vector X, vector B. Um, why are we doing this? Um, because a solve, a sparse solve really dominates um, simulations in many, many cases. Um, here's just a, a schematic uh, as we increase N and as we increase P. Um, the solver cost can, can really dominate. And I think this image is attributed to David. Is it? I've been using it for a really long time and <laughs> haven't put your name on there. Now it is. Um, this comes up in a, in a number of cases. Here's uh, our, our Center for Exascale Simulation of Plasma Coupled Combustion. Um, the, the problem is um, we have uh, a plasma, um, a charged gas, and we're studying the mechanisms of plasma and um, sustained combustion in these cases. And so if you look at, here we have a, a, a laser starting and, and combusting a, a, a flow, and we'd like to study this in a, in a um, predictive science setting. And um, more recent calculations have been in this, this ACT setup, an arc um, combustion tunnel that we have at Illinois. Um, a plasma arc uh, is instrumental in, in forming the, um, the plasma. It influences the, the flow in, in, this, in this tunnel. And at the heart of that is something called an elliptic solve. So we have um, uh, divgrad phi, so just a, a, uh, an elliptic um, uh, Poisson problem. And that's a global problem. At the heart of that problem is then a global matrix solve. And this is the thing that's going to be a, a major bottleneck in our computations. Um, in this particular case, I just thought this was a cool picture because the, the electric field plays a, a really small role um, in the formation of the plasma. Uh, it happens um, kind of right in this spot, uh, kind of right in here. And um, in terms of the over overall flow, it, it, it's a, a very small part. But in terms of the overall calculation, it's, it's a major expense. So here's, here's the, the, the underlying problem. It's, it's pretty simple. AX equals B. And we're going to get into the weeds into this uh, a little bit. Um, the sparse matrix operations are communication dominant. Um, performance models here are going to play a key role. Blue waters. Um, uh, allowed us to develop very clean performance models to study this. Um, exploiting the machine layout is going to play an important role in order to minimize these types of communication bottlenecks. Um, and Blue Waters enabled us to, to test and to develop and actually scale these codes um, in a very clean way where we could, where we could study them. We have two packages um, that came out of a lot of this Blue Waters work, um, a structured multigrid solver and an unstructured multigrid solver. And I'll be talking about what that actually means in, in a second. So we have a matrix A, and it's sparse. And a sparse matrix is just a data relationship. It just says two things are connected. And that can be very structured, where we have that on the left. And that might be from a grid. Or it might come from unstructured grids, or maybe from problems that don't even arise from grids. And that's a data relationship that we see in the right. We're going to solve this matrix problem AX equals B using something called multigrid. And multigrid um, uses a series of, of smaller or successively smaller problems to try to iteratively annihilate the error. Okay, and so the problem looks like, looks like this. If we're given a fine problem on the left, there's just a mesh. And it might be a finite element problem. And it's a global elliptic one. Um, and the matrix or the data relationship is on the right. We're going to use a coarse representation of that or a smaller representation. And that might look like this one, all of the magenta squares. And look at the data relationship on the right then. Okay, It's smaller. And we can keep going. Fewer problems or fewer points and kind of a more expansive data relationship, but it's smaller. 
And so this is what a multi-level method does. It takes a, a very big problem. The size of our matrix might be a trillion or a billion. Um, and we're reducing it down to, you know, even matrices of, of this size. Our multi-level method, the key takeaway from this is that we're going to have fundamentally a, a single operation that we need to focus on. It's a sparse matrix vector multiply. So we take a vector and we hit it with a matrix. And that's relatively simple, but it turns out that that requires a huge amount of communication in the problem. So let's take a look at a sparse matrix. I have a sparse matrix on the right there, and I've just laid out all of the non-zeros in that matrix row-wise. And we'll take a look at a simple algorithm. We're going to step through each row of the matrix, and we're going to step through each non-zero in that row. And so we can picture this. If all of our non-zeros are nice and tightly aligned, we're going to have nice memory access, and our communication in that is going to be fairly predictable. If, on the other hand, we have something that's a little bit more scattered, it's going to be very, very communication dominant. So here's a schematic of what happens in parallel to a sparse matrix vector multiply. We're going to take a matrix A, and they're not step over here. We're going to we're going to divide it row-wise into four processors in this example. And I guess on the white right, I'm using one of six processors. But look at where data is sent in the matrix vector multiply. If we look at the red values, I'm sending those red values to processor 0, 1, 2, and 3. If I look at the um, uh, light blue ones, I'm sending that from process 4 to processors 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so that's a lot of communication for such, for such a simple operation. And so we're going to try to fix that. And one reason to do that is if I look at our multi-level method, the method that says, let's make a, a, a problem smaller and a problem smaller to iteratively annihilate the error, it actually costs more to use smaller problems. And so we've kind of wrecked you know, decades of algorithm development because we thought we were going to have something that was cheaper, but now we've, we're putting these communication demands on the algorithm that we hadn't intended. And so you can see in this plot, um, the one on the right is probably the, the one to focus on. At 0, that's the problem we're given. And at 4, we've made the problem so small, probably 20 or 50 or 100 times smaller than the original problem, but it's costing um, you know, a factor of 10 higher. And this happens on a huge range of problems with this type of method. So it's designed to be an optimal solver, um, yet the communication costs uh, really dominate. And so we want to try to fix this, the, the uh, orange part. Um, just setting up the algorithm on the left takes a lot of work. And it takes matrix matrix multiplies and matrix vector multiplies. And so that's the, the key takeaway on there. All these problems are on our blue waters. So how do we address this? There's, this is not an old, uh, a new problem. This has been around in many different forms. We could remove data. So if we have a smart, sparse matrix problem, we could just drop some entries. Some of them probably aren't needed. Uh, we could re, realign the data. So just make it more tightly banded to, um, to lower the communication costs. We could partition the data in different ways. We could use 2D partitions, 1 1⁄2D partitions. What we're going to focus on, each one of those has a cost to it, right? a cost in accuracy, a cost in real mechanical cost. We're going to try to do something where we don't change the algorithm, but we're going to change the, the data traffic at the end. And let me, show, let me show you how we do that. So a couple of observations. One is, um, in here's AMG level on the, the bottom. Okay, the problem gets smaller and more expansive. The number of messages that we're sending grows dramatically, where we were expecting a much cheaper problem. In the middle over on the right, the maximum size of those messages also increases dramatically. So if we're going to win on this one, we got to reduce each one of those curves. Here's another observation. Here we did a, a ping pong test where we're sending from one node on Blue Waters to another node on Blue Waters, and we're increasing the number of cores that are doing or participating in that ping pong. And what happens is two things. You have, you have limiting returns on using a higher number of cores because of injection, 
limits um, into the network. And the second thing is that we can communicate um, between two cores on the same node much more rapidly than we can with two cores that are on two different nodes. That one probably is, is, is clear. And so we're going to try to try to utilize that. The other thing is that machines like Blue Waters have a locality to them, locality in, in the nodes, locality with sockets, um, and, and even deeper. And we're going to try to try to harness that. So here's a node level approach. I'm going to take our sparse matrix that we had before, and instead of having processor layout, I'm going to divide it into nodes. So I'm going to know that processor 0 and 1 are all on the same node, and 2 and 3 are on the same node, and 3 and 4 are on the same node, uh, 4 and 5 are on the same node, and design our algorithm with, with that in mind. Here's the standard communication. Okay. Um, here we're going to have uh, core P on node N is going to send all of its data, sometimes duplicated across the network, to different processors on node M. Uh, another scenario we might have is that all of the processors on node N um, are sending values to core Q on node M. And each one of these lines that goes between the two nodes is the costly line. And so we want to try to, try to limit that. And so we came up with two different algorithms um, that don't change the underlying outcome. Uh, one is, we just call it three step, because there's three steps to it. Step one is that we're going to gather all the messages that we're going to have to send off node to a single core on a node. Step two, we're going we're to pay that cost to send it to another node. And step three is that we're going to do a scatter. OK, so now we've, now we've increased a lot of side work, but we've decreased the number of messages that go on the network. Another one that we do is kind of a hybrid, where if we had a huge message from that, we're not going to have the, the right, uh, the intended outcome. So we're going to do some, something, some halvesies, where we're going to take each core is going to communicate with the respective core on the other node, thereby somewhat limiting the amount of communication, but also limiting the amount of local work that we need to do in order to achieve that. Let me show you a couple of results. Um, here, this is with just three-step communication. Uh, look, in, in this problem, this one's a, just an elastic bar. It's a nice AMG problem, because AMG converges. Um, but uh, we can see a, a, a pretty dramatic increase in the total, decrease in the total time. Okay? There's that spike. These problems in the middle should be a lot cheaper. And now we can, now we can get in, get something a little closer. The other one, and this is where we set out on the problem, studying things on, on blue waters, was we wanted to extend the strong scaling limits, meaning using more and more cores to actually, to actually reduce the total time to solve our problem, um, and not necessarily scaling up the size of the problem. And here with, with our reference implementation, which is what Hyper does, uh, we can dramatically um, scale out those results. If we look. Um, a little bit further. Uh, if we look at the, the matrix matrix on the right and the matrix vector multiply on the left, uh, on the right and the matrix matrix on the left, we see that um, things aren't so clear on what we should be doing. Sometimes, check out at the beginning here, standard communication actually does just fine. We don't want to pay the overhead to do all of that exchange on node. Um, other places in the middle, two step makes sense. Okay. We want to com communicate directly with the cores on each, on re each respective node. Other times, um, it's, uh, it's three-step, right? And so we used our performance models that we had designed and um, uh, just set this out in a, predictive fa or in a predictive fashion. So every time we do an operation, we predict which one is going to be faster, and we pick it. So this one just says, here are all the tests, select, in this case, um, three step, and we kind of see the continued speed up from that. Okay. All of this is very tricky to arrange for every problem, and so one of the outcomes of this project is that we're putting together a Node-Aware MPI library where somebody can pick up this library, they can identify um, their Node-Aware send and receives out of the box. They don't have to do work on setting up how the communication will work between nodes. And so this is in development. Um, and out on Git, I'll give you a, 
thing. A couple of the impacts of, of Blue Waters. Um, these uh, are a number of students who've been on um, our, the, the allocation over the last couple of years. Um, most of the work that I showed today was the work of Amanda Benz, um, who graduated recently, Andrew Reisner, um, working on the, the structured part of this. Lucas Spies um, has just joined us. Um, our early work with Bill Gropp and um, Philip Samphis um, on performance modeling. Shelby Lockhart is, is um, looking at convergence issues. Um, and then a, a Blue Waters fellow, actually John Calhoun, um, was working on resilience under this project. So I think one of, one of the invaluable parts of Blue Waters has been a recruitment tool. Um, students being able to directly get on machines um, and work with all of the infrastructure around that. Um, the other part is, is uh, just the contribution to the visibility and quality of the work. We have immediate access to machines, we can scale, we can repeat the tests. Um, and it's been, a new it's been a gateway to develop new codes um, uh, and new methods for, for upcoming architectures that we're, we're seeing. So um, just a couple of links to the two multigrid codes and then the NodeAware MPI library and I'll 